Let's sing together. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I am the Lord that strengthens thee. I am the Lord that strengthens thee. I am the Lord that strengthens thee. Good morning. morning. Couple of announcements before we begin. Soup Kitchen needs casseroles and bread. Is that right, Kathy? Good. All right. So they need casseroles and bread if you can help out with that. Also, uh, the bypass bypass surgery in Wichita this week has been uh, moved for Lee Fessler. Lee Fessler, he continues to oh, he continues to recover from bypass surgery in, in Wichita. Uh, he's been moved to, uh, uh, from ICU into a private room. Uh, finally, in the announcements, Neil Schmidtberger's funeral will be July 5th at 11 a.m. right here at Eastwood. So if you can attend that, that would be fantastic. I love this week. This is my favorite week out of the year, and it's not even close. I love the week of Independence Day. And I know not everybody's that way. I love fireworks. Not everybody loves fireworks. Some people have pets that don't like fireworks. I can understand, not, but I love it. I love Independence Day. I, I started a ritual or something that I do every year a couple years ago, and I read the Constitution, and I read uh, the, the Declaration of Independence, and I just... I love it. That document is so rich and so amazing. And the men that wrote that were all kind of mentored by a man, if I can remember his name right, George Wycliffe. And George didn't teach them to what to think. He, he taught them how. And, and the things that are written in the, those documents are just incredible. And, and the guaranteeing of freedom for, for everyone is, is just amazing and, and how that all works out. Man, I just, I just love it. Everything about this week. I wouldn't have to shoot off a single firework. And I love fireworks. And I would be excited about this week. You know, it's, it's amazing. I still have all ten fingers. I love fireworks so much. <laughs> Our forefathers rebelled against the king. And they created a representative republic, one of the greatest representative rep- republics or, or governments, rep- representative governments of all time. Second in my reading only to the great Carthage. But this is really hard, and it makes a very big giant in my life. This sounds like a nas- Christian nationalist intro-, intro to service, and I guarantee you it's not. Because a giant in my life is that on this physical plane, I live in a country that says my vote matters, that what I do matters, what I can do is my free will, and that's my rights, and that's my privileges to do as I wish. And at its core, I think that's what it means to be an American, to do what you want as long as you're not infringing on the rights of others. He rebelled against the king. But as a Christian first, and a Christian foremost, I live in a kingdom with a dictator. And and in this kingdom, we're not free to do as we will, but as he wills. And that's a struggle I wrestle with every single day. Instead of doing what Matt wants to do, I need and I must do what Christ wants me to do. We may not be free to do as we wish in every circumstance, but we are free from sin. 
And that is what we as a people celebrate every single day as a united people of the one true king. I love this week. This week is fantastic because I get to celebrate the independence of our nation and the the forethought and the thinking of our forefathers, but it pales in comparison to the citizenship and the freedom that I have in Christ. Let's pray. Holy God, thank you so much for this day. And thank you for your son who conquered death and gave us hope of resurrection. Father, as as we go forward with this week, allow us to remember and understand and and realize that we uh, might be free in this country, but we are always and always will be bond servants to you and and to always do as as you will and not we will. Father, bless us in this, this worship service. Allow us to do so in spirit and truth and allow us to do it in a way that is pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's rejoice and praise the Lord. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior who me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depth of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depth of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness transported, I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depth of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. Let's prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper with Night with Evan Pinion. Night with ebon pinion brought it o'er the veil. All around was silent, save the night wind's wail. When Christ, the man of sorrow, in tears and sweat and blood, prostrate in the garden, raised his voice to God. Smitten for offenses which were not his own, he for our transgressions had to weep alone. No friend with words to comfort, nor hand to help was there. When the meek and lowly Humbly bowed in prayer. Abba, Father, Father, if indeed it may, let this cup of anguish pass from me, I pray. Yet if it must be suffered by me, thine only Son, Abba, Father, Father, let thy will be done.
Hello again. Uh, Bill Arnold had communion this morning, and then he's preaching somewhere else. So, and we're elders. Most of us are out of town as well. Most of them, not us. I am not an elder. One of my favorite camp songs is I Belong to Jesus. And it goes, I belong to Jesus, I belong to him. I belong to Jesus. It goes in, and it starts talking about he was lifted up, and he paid a costly price. He bought me with the blood of his own life. Those are interesting words. What do you buy? What do you purchase? It's where the, the bond service bond servant or slave of Christ terminology kind of comes from. We were bought. We were never free. I mean, we were free to sin. We were free to do as we wanted to, but we were owned by something else. And through Jesus' sacrifice, salvation was brought to us. It goes on and you scream out at one part, and it says, Satan was defeated. And you just scream it at the top of your lungs. And it's just so amazing. And when we gather around the table, we get to remember that we were bought, and we were purchased with his blood, that his body was sacrificed for you and me, so that we might live eternally with him song is so incredible. It's so upbeat. It's so fast. Sometimes you just, you just really get into it. You just forget about what it's saying. But what it's saying is, you're worth it. You're important. And Jesus loves you, and the Father loves you so much that you no longer belong to this world, but you belong to with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, as, as we go around your table and, and take this communion, allow us to do so that's, that's pleasing in your sight. Allow us to do so in a way that, that we remember and, and can memorialize the, the amazing sacrifice that Christ made for, for all of us. Please bless us now as we take it in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus is quoted saying in the Gospels that this cup is a covenant. It's a blood covenant. He bought me with the blood of his own life so that I could be sealed forever with him. Let's pray. Holy God, just thank you so much for, for this sacrifice. Thank you for your sacrifice as you saw him die for us. Please bless us now as you take this cup and allow us to do so in a way that, that we truly remember that this is not a habit and that, that we can truly slightly grasp the sacrifice that was made for us. In Jesus' name, amen. According to Google, there is 2.937 million people in the state of Kansas. Every year in Kansas, again, according to Google, $10.70 is what everybody pays on average for fireworks. My math is horrible, but that comes out to over $31 million a year spent on fireworks during this week in the state of Kansas. 
I think that's awesome. <laughs> if you don't like fireworks, if you got the, the post-traumatic stress or something like that, I understand. And, and actually, I don't understand that. But, you know, we can, we can sit up here, we can stand up here and say, if you've got enough money to do that, you've got enough money to give. No, you know what is so neat about that is so many of these fireworks stands do have a charitable cause behind them. Uh, I know East Point for a long time, I don't know if they still do or not, they run one, the East Point Church of Christ in Wichita, and they use a portion of those profits to go to missions in Zimbabwe. I know that there's so many that goes to booster clubs. I know that they go through so many other things, and I know that a lot of us will be spending our money, so maybe do so consciously this year as to what those proceeds are going for. And I also know that Sunday morning giving a lot of times is our foundational giving, is what I call it. It's, it's what we do every week. And then some of us have pet charities, is, is what I would call them. Maybe you give to this cause over here, this cause over there, and this is not the only place you give, and that's incredible. But as you think about where you're giving, understand that when you're giving with a cheerful and happy heart, God does amazing things with those funds. And maybe this is your foundational one. Maybe your, your pet giving is, is the Mission Sundays, and that's awesome, and that's amazing what we've been able to do with that. But maybe, think about maybe you just do a little bit more here or there. And you give with a cheerful and happy heart, and you be generous wherever you go, because you can, because you want to, because you desire to do so. Giving's amazing. I am not a strong giver personally. It's really hard for me to give at times, but I also know that when I give, I feel better. And, and that's a feeling-based thing, but I also see what my gifts and that's pretty amazing too. No, you, your right hand shouldn't know what your left hand is doing, but at the same time, when you give and you give and it feels good, I think that's a reward that the Father has built in for each and every one of us. So be deliberate and choose your missions that you give to wisely, and thank you so much for any contributions that you make today or last week or whenever you do. We truly, truly appreciate it. Let's pray. Holy God, thank you so much for, for the ability just to, to work and, and support ourselves and, and this nation and where you have placed us. Uh, please bless us now as we give back. Allow us to do so with, with a truly a cheerful and happy heart. Uh, it's kind of strange. This is one of the very few places in, in the, the whole Bible that you command us to be happy. Uh, you always command us to be joyful, but, but allow us to do so and just be happy at this point and understand that it is a circumstance and a happening that happens that, that gives us this feeling, and that's okay. Please bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. While we're passing the baskets, we'll sing a mighty fortress. This is an oldie goldie. Hopefully you all know it. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we our... <laughs> Our striving would be losing. Were not the right one on our side, the man of God's own choosing. 
does ask that they may be. Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabbath is his name. From age to age the same. And he must win the battle. And though this world with evil fill is threatened to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. Let goods and kindreds go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abiding still. His kingdom is forever. Told you we hadn't sing it for a long time, neither have I. All righty, children, come on down. All righty. So we're going to try a new song today. Hopefully, I'm going to need some participation from the church. Uh, do you all know the Three Wandering Jews song? Hopefully you do. It goes, once there, once there were three wandering Jews, once there were three wandering Jews, wandering, wandering Jews, Jews, Jews. And so that's the thing. And we'll split side for wandering and one side for Jews. And so whichever side, you can help the kids when we sing that. But... All righty, we're going to try something new. So y'all are going to sing Wandering. I know you, so this side, Wandering. So Wandering, when we say Wandering, you're going to sing really loud. Say Wandering. Okay, really loud. Okay. That side is going to be Jews. So this side is going to be Jews. So when we say Jews, say really loud, okay? All right, we're, yeah, loud, yeah. But stay seated. But stay seated. You say loud, but you gotta stay seated. But all righty, we're gonna only the first verse because I have the only part I know. So we'll sing it through twice. All right. Once through were the wandering Jews. Once through were the wandering Jews. Wandering, wandering Jew, 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 Jew. Wandering, wandering Jew, Jew, Jew. Once there were three wandering Jews. All right, that was a great first attempt. <laughs> We're going to try it again, all right? We'll try it again, all right? Ready? Once there were three wandering Jews. Once there were three wandering Jews. Wandering, wandering, Jew, Jew, do. Wandering, wandering, Jew, Jew. Once there were three wandering Jews. That was awesome. That was awesome. <laughs> okay, we'll do it one more time, then we'll try a different song. All right? All right. Once there were three wandering Jews. Once there were three wandering Jews. Wandering, wandering Jews. Wandering, wandering Jews. Once there were three wandering Jews. Man, third time was the charm. That is right on. All right. We're going to do another song. We're going to do the fruit of the spirit. Okay. All right. Ariel. A dragon fruit? Oh, man. All righty. Ready? All right. The fruit of the spirit is not a dragon fruit. The fruit of the spirit is not a dragon fruit. Alright, you go ahead. Yep, yeah, go ahead. 
Go ahead. You. A cucumber. All righty. <laughs> we'll do a cucumber, even though it's a ve good vegetable. All right. The fruit of the spirit's not a cucumber. The fruit of the spirit's not a cucumber. And if you want to be a cucumber, you might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the spirit, because the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All righty, that was awesome. We'll be dismissed to Bible Hour. Jesus loves me, this I know. Can't go into battle sitting down, so let's have a stand here. <laughs> Need to sing this song to go along with Mr. Wayne's listen, so let's sing The Battle Belongs with the Lord. To the Lord. <coughs> In heavenly armor we'll enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord, and we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord, and we sing glory, honor, power, and strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He raised up a standard, the power of his blood. The battle belongs to the Lord, and we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord, and we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses in heart, do not fear, the battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. Please be seated. This morning's scripture reading, <clears throat> reading will be taken from Ephesians, chapter 6. I'll be reading verses 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. 
With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. All right, good morning, church family. Warm welcome to all the visitors that we have with us. I heard some reports this is one of the busiest travel weekends of the year. So I know we have a, a lot of folks gone, but we also have a lot of visitors here. So definitely a, a warm, warm welcome. Uh, appreciated uh, David uh, reading the scriptures here. Appreciate Steve leading us in song here this morning. Matt, you kind of got double duty, you know, with a busy weekend. So we appreciate uh, your thoughts. I am a little concerned about, you know, our, our preacher's house over here with Matt and his love for explosives, though, you know. So maybe say an extra <laughs> prayer for Matt and his family on, on the fourth there. So if you happen to have your Bibles handy, would you turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17? 1 Samuel chapter 17. As you're turning over there, I want to remind all of us, and you know this, that we all have giants that we face in life. I mean, there's always something that seems to be kind of on the perimeter of our life that we could refer to as a giant. It seems like, you know, this thing keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. We battle it. Maybe we have some success over it, but it continues to grow. For example, it might be a giant of fear. You ever wrestled with that giant of fear that kind of keeps you up late at night and you're thinking, well, what am I going to do with this or who's going to do that or how are we going to go about doing this? Maybe it's the fear of the unknown, maybe a fear of the future. Perhaps it is the fear of grief. We just finished up eight or 13 weeks of our Grief Share program. And uh, one thing that we learn about grief is you can't go over it. You can't go around it from side to side. You can't go under it. You've got to go through grief. You've got to face grief. And so those that participated in that had that courage, watched videos, had open discussions, had leaders that cared and prayed for them. And by the end of those 13 weeks, they were able to take a few positive steps in this area of dealing with grief. Maybe it's the uh, giant of personal sin, an area in your life that you know that you are just weak and you are vulnerable. It could be pride, it could be envy, it could be gluttony, it could be pornography. The list goes on and on. Or maybe it's even the giant of addiction. I mean, you might have been clean and sober for five years, ten years. I know of a brother in Christ, he was sober for 20 years, and then temptation of addiction uh, and enveloped him once again. And this is a giant addiction you're going to battle all the days of your life if you struggle with that. So how do you overcome a giant? We're going to look at a very familiar biblical story, um, uh, the story of David and Goliath. Now, we just took down all the amazing decorations for our Vacation Bible School that we just hosted recently, and it was on the, the life of David. In one of those stories, uh, we talked about David and Goliath, and I got to play in a skit that I was Goliath dressed in all of my armor, and, and little Augie Carden, uh, he was David, and he took me down with his little sling and his stone. I was having a bad day. Uh, I can't wait for the rematch on that, but we, we talked... <laughs> Taught, taught that lesson and really enjoyed it. But, you know, for some people, we have heard that so long, it almost takes like a, a fairy tale kind of existence to it. But I want to remind us that that was a historical event. There truly was a King Saul that led Israel. There truly was a young man by the name of David who was a shepherd that would eventually grow up and to be one, arguably, one of the greatest kings of Israel. And there truly was a, a, a giant of a man, nine foot, nine inches tall, Goliath of Gath of Philistia. So this was a historical event. I want us to see what kind of lessons we could learn from this about how do we go about conquering giants. I want to give us a little background if you're there in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Let's first of all uh, look in the opening verses here of the Valley of Elah. We start here in verse 1 of chapter 17. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Soko in Judah. And they pitched camp at uh, Ephes, Damim, between Soko and Azekah. And Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill 
and the Israelites another uh, with the valley between them. So here we see the Israelites battling the Philistines. As they set up their armies, one's on one hill, another's on the other, and you got the Valley of Allah in between. And then the Philistines, of course, have their giant, their champion, Goliath, that comes out and challenges Israel. And notice how he kind of makes this challenge. I, I call it, let's make a deal. What was his challenge? Notice here in verse 8 what Goliath says to the Israelite army. Goliath stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. And if he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I will overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. And on hearing this, the Philistine's words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now, no Israelite wanted to fight this behemoth of a man, this man Goliath. As he goes out for 40 days, according to verse 16, and taunts them day after day after day for somebody to come out and fight him. And ever, whenever he does that, the people just scatter and run with fear. Now Saul, who is the king of Israel, who is head and shoulders taller than any other man around, would be the natural person to start the fight, but he does not want to have anything to do with Goliath. Meanwhile, David's father, Jesse, wants to give him an assignment. Notice here in verses 17 through 19 of that same chapter. Now Jesse said to his son, David, Take this ephah of roasted grain, these ten loaves of bread to your brothers, and hurry to their camp. Take all, uh, along these ten cheeses to the commander of the unit. See how your brothers are, and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah, fighting against the Philistines. So David's father gives him assignments, and I, I, you need to take some food up to your brothers. Basically, I think it's kind of a pizza delivery. You know, bread and cheese, right? In that pizza or maybe quesadillas. Take some of these quesadillas up to your brothers. Now, as David approaches these lines, these battle lines, he hears this giant from Philistia come out and, and say these terrible and derogatory words toward the army of Israel. And he begins to ask some questions. Verse 26. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills the Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? So as he's starting to ask these questions, David has uh, an older brother in the army. Actually, he has a few brothers, older brothers that are in the army, and his brother Eliab begins to burn with anger at his younger brother. Notice what he says in verse 28. Now, when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know you're conceited, you and how, you're wick how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. So David's going to endure this great rebuke from his brother, but he does say that I am willing to fight this giant. See, J uh, David has a, a very interesting background, that uh, he has incredible faith and belief and trust in Almighty God. He's had success in battle before, as a shepherd, he's defeated bears, he's uh, uh, defeated lions. But notice that his focus is not on his own power, skill, and ability. Not on his marksmanship, not on his courage, but the focus is always on God. That God has given him success over these things, and God will give him success over this giant Goliath. And so I think that's a reminder for us that Goliath was big and powerful and strong. But God is much bigger, much more powerful, and much stronger than any giant. The battle truly belongs to the Lord. So let's see this uh, take place in action here. Uh, pick it up with me in verse 40 through 44 now. Let's hear this historical event. 
Verse 40. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with a sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, while the shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David, he looked to David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with the health and health and handsome. And he despised him, and he said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I will give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David now has his words that he will say. David says to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you defile. You, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I'll give the carcass of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. The whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And all those gathered here will know that it's not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he gave all and gave all of you into our hands. The Philistine moved closer to attack him, and David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. And reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sunk into his forehead. He fell face down to the ground. And so David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone without a sword in his hand. He struck down the Philistine and killed him. Now David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. And after he had killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. Oh. Isn't that an amazing story? I love it. Like Matt loves fireworks, I love Bible stories like this. What a victory. David the shepherd boy cuts down this giant Goliath. So what do we learn? Let me give you four lessons this morning from this incredible historical event. Lesson number one, everyone, everyone, let me emphasize Everyone has giants. We all face severe hardship, trial, and difficult challenges, often referred to as giants in our life. All of us face them. Now, one thing we need to realize is that all of these giants are common. Notice how Paul says it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. No temptation has taken, overtaken you, but such as is common to man. God's faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with temptation will provide the way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. So while all of us have giants, every one of these is defeatable. Every one of these giants can be defeated. They are defeatable. Now, giants usually do not start off big. They start off small. Now, can you imagine Goliath as being small at some time? At one time, he was a baby. I imagine he was a very large baby. I read about one of the, the larger heavyweights, uh, Primo Carnia. He was about six foot eight, weighed close to 300 pounds. He said he weighed about uh, 18 to 20 pounds when he was born. Now imagine Goliath, how much he must have weighed as a baby. What if he was a 25 or 35 pound baby? His poor mother. So he started off small, but then he would have grown to be a toddler, can you imagine him as a two or three year old? All right, you think some of our two or three year olds are active. Imagine Goliath at two or three. And then eventually this giant would have become a teenager, right? A teenager. So here you have a picture of uh, Robert Waldro. This is when he was 18 years old. So he's the tallest man as you look in Genesis uh, book of world records and all that. So he's kind of the tallest modern man. When he was 18, he was eight foot five and three quarter inches tall. Now he eventually grow, he'll die at the age of 22. He'll be about eight foot 11, still nearly a foot shorter than Goliath. So imagine Goliath as a nine foot teenager. Now, uh, Mr. Uh, Waldro there will weigh about 430 pounds when he's 22 years old. So here Goliath is and he's carrying all this heavy armor. I kind of think of Andre the Giant. 
when I'm thinking of Goliath, okay? Not a tall, thin guy like, uh, like Robert Waldrow, but imagine Andre the Giant, except nine foot tall, so two foot taller than Andre the Giant. So maybe he's five, 700 pounds of a mountain man that's coming up against him. Again, things start small, but they get bigger over time. Now, several years ago, when our kids were little and they were going to Union Valley School, they had a little unit that they would do during the springtime where they would hatch some chicken eggs. And so when they had hatched the little chicken eggs, you know, some very cute little chicks would pop out. And people loved having these little chicks, but you know what chicks end up doing? Yes, now you're thinking, they turn into chickens, don't they? And so now um, there's larger chickens and banny roosters. If any of you have ever been around chickens and banny roosters, banny roosters are aggressive. And I, I remember some of the little chicks that made it to our home when we lived over there in, uh, uh, on Apple Lane and, uh, and some PTSD that we have from dealing with some of those little rascals. So people found out we had some acreage and so they were bringing us all their, their chickens. So we got into the chicken business for four or five years and we appreciated Roy Jackson and Ron Miller and Bill Doxon at the time helping to build that for us. But isn't that how sin is? Starts off small. Starts off little. I'll just kind of use this maybe as a, a liberty here, and then it grows and grows. And the next thing I know, I can be enslaved by sin. Or one day you might be face, facing this kind of giant. Maybe you have a non believing husband or a wife or a wayward child, and you almost are at the point I have given up hope. I have I've prayed about it, I've talked to them, I've nagged them about it, and it doesn't seem to be changing anything. And so I have this incredible giant. Well, every one of us faces a giant. We all have giants. But secondly, I want to leave you with the battle belongs to the Lord. Do you know that? The battle belongs to Jehovah God. David will say it several times. I come against you in the name of the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel. The Lord will deliver you into my hands. For the battle is the Lord's, and I give and, I, and he will give you all into our hands. You see, oftentimes, that's why we're being defeated. We're trying to fight this giant in our own flesh, with our own strength. And we're not realizing and tapping into the incredible spiritual, moral, virtuous power of God at work in our life and in our situation. Now, his brother David was reading from Ephesians chapter 6, as it's talking about the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit. Verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. See, that's where the strength is, not in yourself. And David realized that at a young age, and I'd pray for all of us, let's at a youngest age realize that our greatest strength is our strength in God, our strength in Jehovah God. Don't rely upon ourselves but rely upon God. He's much bigger, much more powerful, stronger than our greatest of giants. So when you see that object, when you see that giant, compare it to the light of God and see how much stronger and greater he is. I love how John says it in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is, here's your word, greater than he who is in the world. So what are you facing right now? All of us face giants. The battle is the Lord's. It belongs to the Lord. And so let's say you're laying down at night. Your mind is flooding with, what are we going to do with this? How are we going to handle that? Who's going to deal with this individual? What, what's going to be our plan going ahead? Let's give it to the Lord. Lord, this is your battle. This is your strength. I want to put it in your hands, and you can help me, help us overcome this mighty, mighty giant. And what does the Apostle Paul remind us? Whenever we're facing situations that are very anxious and cause us to worry, what can we do? Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So the battle belongs to the Lord. God is much bigger. God is much stronger. God is much greater than your giant. And then thirdly, we need to attack that giant. 
Did you notice what he did? As Goliath came out, Goliath was looking him over. He said, what am I, a dog that you come out with your sticks and your stones to come fight me? You know, I'm going to give you over to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David comes, and what does he do? He ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. He attacked that giant. So let's get very practical. Let's say you have a giant of drinking, drugs, not living within your means. You know, this is an ongoing problem, perhaps. You've got to deal with it. You've got to stop rationalizing it. You've got to stop trying to minimize it. Stop making excuses for it. You've got to deal with it. This is a problem. This is a giant in my life. And it starts by saying, I have a problem. I have a giant. I have sinned. I'm under the power. I'm under the stronghold of this particular sin. You see, as long as we continue to hide and continue to deny and try to keep this thing in the darkness, that's where it grows. That's where it's flourishing. And so you need to be transparent. It might be with your husband. It might be with your wife. It might be with a trusted church leader, a, a, a minister, an, an elder, a, a dear friend, a qualified counselor. You know, I've got a problem with, fill in the blank, drinking, alcohol, drugs, problem telling the truth, whatever this problem is, and then come up with a plan to fight it. Yes, the battle belongs to the Lord, right? That's where the power, that's where the strength is coming from. David still had to get the five smooth stones. David still needed to use his sling. David still needed to attack this problem. He had to address it. I love what Billy Sunday, the 19th, 20th century American evangelist, used to say about fighting sin. I am against sin. I'll kick it as long as I have a foot. I'll fight it as long as I've got a fist. I'll butt it as long as I've got a head. I'll bite it as long as I've got a tooth. And when I'm old and fistless and footless and toothless, I'll gum it till I go home to glory and it goes home to perdition. Now isn't that a great attitude to have when fighting sin? We're violating the moral laws of God. And we need to have a determination to say, God, you're greater than this giant. I'm relying, I'm trusting in you and your power and grace and your providence at work in my life, but I'm going to do my part to fight and attack this thing. And then, fourthly, finish it off. Finish it off. David might have watched this movie. You ever seen these movies? Maybe some of these action movies, like with Sylvester Stallone or Arnold Schwarzenegger or some of these other dramatic ones, they have this incredible fight scene. They're fighting, oh man, they're barely alive. Somehow they finally defeat and kill the bad guy. But then what do they do when the bad guy's laying over there? They turn their back to him, and they're having talk, and they're having dialogue, and what does that bad guy start to do? He starts to come back to life again, doesn't he? And tries to take his life. So David probably was familiar with that kind of scenario. And so, yes, he took him down with the sling and the stone, but he pulls out Goliath's sword and chops his head off. Why? He was probably still breathing. Sometimes we're way too gentle with our giant, and we want to cuddle that giant. Oh, poor little giant. I'm sorry that I defeated you and that you had such a fall. No, you've got to kill that thing. You've got to put that thing down. So if it's drugs, I've got to get rid of all these drugs. If it's alcohol, I'm pouring it down the toilet and flushing it. One time I, I helped a brother that was struggling with that particular addiction. We went down to his basement. I had an old brown pickup. We loaded every single beer bottle, beer can, uh, case of beer, beer bong, beer barrel, and we filled up. I mean, I literally had to strap that thing in. There were so many of those. I was a little nervous being an evangelist, you know, carting around that much alcohol, you know. They're like, what's that, Wayne, side hustle working for Budweiser or whatever, you know? But I didn't care about my personal possible shame in the situation because I had a brother that was in trouble and needed to get out of the darkness where it was hidden in the basement to say, I know this is going to take us an hour and a half to get all this stuff out, but we're going to take that first step 
to fight against this giant and we're going to put it down. And praise God, he's doing so well because we attacked a giant with God's help, with great determination and determined to put it down. So, if, if you are struggling with a sin, whatever it is that I've mentioned, let's say maybe it's a sexual sin. We again violated God's moral law. Psalm 51 says, against you, Lord, and you only have I sinned. And that was David talking about his fall with Bathsheba. Maybe it's looking at inappropriate images, pornography. What could you do? You could buy an internet filter. You could install accountability passwords uh, or uh, applications on your electronic devices. You, if you're married uh, and you have a wife or a husband, you can have passwords that you share everything. If necessary, guess what? Get rid of that computer. Get a dumb phone. Get rid of that smartphone. Buy a dumb phone. Didn't Jesus say, here's, here's our attitude when it comes to sin. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. And through, the, through this use of hyperbole, Jesus says, hey, sometimes you just got to get radical to overcome sin. That's what David did with Goliath. Yeah, he defeated him with the stone to the forehead, but he finished the job when he took his head off with the sword. And so that's the way it works, doesn't it? Did you notice how inspired the Israelite army became as Goliath was defeated? And have you seen that? When you've seen brothers and sisters in Christ overcome great obstacles, they have worked hard, they prayed hard, they uh, gathered good, healthy people around them, they failed a time or two, but they just stayed determined. When you see their success, it inspires you to say, with God's help and God's grace and a hard work ethic on my behalf, I can overcome this giant as well. I read this in a recent uh, leadership uh, devotional I, I received just this past Tuesday about a, I guess there was a turbulent war over in the Middle East, and a spy was captured and sentenced to death by a general in the Persian army. And the ger general had come up with a strange um, punishment that he would have for spies that were captured on the battlefield, that he would give them actually an option. They could either face the firing squad or they could go through the dark door. He was gonna give them a choice. And so this spy was captured and he gave them those, those options. You can either face a firing squad or you can go through the dark door. You don't know what's through that dark door, what the experience might be. So the spy that was captured decided, let's go ahead and go with the firing squad. So they take the man out. Firing squad, there's things. General's talking with one of his top lieutenants. He said, that's kind of amazing that you give them choices like that. And he said, well, I try to be fair. He said, I have a question though. What's the dark door? What's through that? He said, you know what that dark door is? It's freedom. He said, I've had very few people take me up on that. We're much more comfortable making the decision of something we're familiar with than making the decision to go with something we're not familiar with. And so today I want to leave us with this thought of God allows us to go through that dark door of freedom when we're facing and conquering our giants. Number one, we begin with, yes, we all have giants. Number two, this battle belongs to the Lord. Number three, I need to be willing to attack and have a plan against this giant. And number four, number four, let's finish the job. Let's get the job done. We're going to offer an invitation here this morning. If anyone feels like they are subject to the invitation, whether it's a response to become a Christian, or there's something that you need us to be praying about, or, we want to, or you need us to partner with you because you're facing a giant right now, won't you come as we stand and sing this selected song? Hear the sweet voice of Jesus say, Come unto me, I am the way. Hearken the loving call, obey. Come for he loves you so. Only a step, only a step. Come for he bled for you and died. He's the same loving Savior, yes.
yet Jesus the crucified Casting your heavy burden down Come to the cross, the world may frown Yet you shall wear a glorious crown When he makes up his own Only a step, only a step Come for he bled for you and died He's the same loving Savior yet Jesus the crucified Open for you the pearly gate Loved ones for now watch and wait Terrible thought to try to lay Jesus I come to thee Only a step only a step, come for he bled for you and died. He's the same loving Savior yet, Jesus the crucified. Please be seated. Ruthie really was just asking that we would pray for her father and, and for David and her and, and uh, pray for the Eastwood family and, and keep Wayne and Steve and Matt in our prayers. But would you just bow with me at this time? Father, we're thankful for Ruthie and uh, that she's a part of our family and uh, she just wants us to remember her, her dad, her her husband herself and keep them in prayers and, and uh, also she wants to remember our, our, our her spiritual family and we we'll grow together uh, become more like the, the have unity like the like the, the unity we have with you and with, between you and Jesus and uh, pray for Wayne and Steve and Matt and and everything they do, and uh, be with uh, Wayne as he uh, takes a little bit of time off uh, just to get refreshed. And he, you know, he doesn't need to have this. Yeah, uh, we just think it's good for him to uh, have this time and and do some studying and and uh, whatever else he needs to do to get refreshed. And, Thank you for our Savior, Jesus, his name, amen. I want to remind you that at 5 o'clock this evening, we will have our ice cream churn off in the fellowship hall. And one of the giants of mine is ice cream, and I don't think I'm going to conquer that guy tonight. <laughs> so let's stand and sing 469 while the rest of you go get your children. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing sky. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the world, the fame shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward down the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame. will vanquish all the host of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. See you tonight.
I left Lloyd standing down here. He was going to give the prayer, but we'll, we'll catch up with him next time. 